theater makers take center stage on this edition of Arts Weekly. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Melinda Haynes, with the IPFW College of Visual and Performing Arts. We'll be talking about two local plays that feature intense subject matter infused with humor. Lauren Nichols from All for One Productions will be here later to tell us about a peculiar people. But first, Tom Hofrichter, Managing Artistic Director of First Presbyterian Theater, is here to tell us about his role in the dark comedy God of Carnage, which is running through Saturday, September 22nd. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, I would love to know what is God of Carnage all about? If you can share the storyline. God of Carnage is a four-hander for people in the show, and it's two sets of married couples who, uh, one of the married couples comes to the other married couple's house because their son has picked up a stick and bashed in our son's oh, face, God. basically knocking out two teeth. And uh, so the two parents are getting together to reasonably discuss their children. <sighs> doesn't quite happen that way. Uh, <laughs> by, the, by the end of the 80, 85 minute play, you, uh, you're pretty clear where these children learn this behavior. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, that one of the things that I think is interesting is that just to make this play more unique, you actually have two real life married couples mm -hmm. in this. I'd love to hear some more about that because you're, you're in this show as well I'm, with I'm your wife. I'm in the show with my wife. Part of it uh, had to do, my wife Nancy is a absolutely fabulous yes, actress um, and uh, I never feel bad casting her because if I don't every other theater in town wants her so yes. <laughs> um, but she's back in an accounting degree getting an accounting degree here at IPFW so I was looking for something that we could work on we hadn't acted together for a while and this came across and once I was convinced Nancy and I would play together, I thought, ooh, it might be fun to get another married couple. And Jay and Melissa Duffer, um, Jay Duffer's the chair of the Huntington University Theater Department, okay. and Melissa's his wife who teaches there. Uh, they're both Actors' Equity members, professional actors. They had substantial careers in New York. Jay goes away and works professionally about every two or three summers as an actor, and Melissa choreographs all over. She just finished choreographing at the Civic talented folks so yeah. anyway we put the four of us in a room and then we brought in my dear friend from uh, well he's from Rochester New York but now he teaches at the University of Wisconsin Platteville when I did my doctoral work uh, I, I met David Schuler so David was the director so we just had a great time <laughs> well that just sounds like a wonderful collaboration of people all together having fun as well as producing this this show the um, it's kind of a ironic portrayal, you know, of these of these parents, you know, for their children. Like you say, that we figure out that by the end where where this behavior mm -hmm. comes from. You know, what um, what do you think happens to the children or the or the audience because the children aren't in it as they're observing this? You know, what is the audience learning well, from this behavior? Well, uh, my hope, because one of the things that does worry me about this show is that people will watch it and laugh because some of the behavior, although horrible it's also pretty funny right. uh, and we'll think oh look at those people behaving so badly um, as opposed to understanding that we are all capable of behaving like that right. um, one of the things one of my favorite pieces of work is Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods and there's a line that keeps recurring no matter what you say children won't listen <laughs> and they keep singing that children won't listen children won't listen and then by the end the lyric changes to no matter what you say children won't listen children will watch and learn. And I think that's what this play is about. Um, those of us who think, you know, children are behaving so badly in our culture, why? Why are kids not behaving well? Well, maybe we are modeling behavior and they're just doing what we're doing. Right. Um, it was uh, also interesting at church the other day, I, I ran into somebody who saw it and he was, he, he kind of, kind of was saying, I'm, you know, but I'm not sure I, that connects with me. And we knew some mutual friends and there were some, some issues that I was able to talk about and go, well, yeah. what about when we behave like this? He goes, oh yeah, I guess we do <laughs> behave like that. <laughs> so people sometimes don't want to admit when they're watching right. theater that those people up on the stage are indeed the people in the audience. Right. Um, you relate to it, I think, that you think yeah. either, ooh, that's funny, I have to remember that line to use mm -hmm. myself, yeah. or ooh, you might see yourself yeah. a little bit and And absolutely, cringe. because it's theater, because it's right. art, you push things to an extreme. Right. But honestly, if, if the human truth isn't there, if the truth of human behavior isn't there, 
um, then the theater isn't uh, isn't very interesting. And I think I think one of the reasons this play has been so immensely successful all over this country and all over the world is the fact that there are some truths going on in this play that we laugh at and then kind of go, ooh, I, did I really laugh at that? That was kind of horrible. Well, I think that's what humor, it's funnier when it is based on truth like mm -hmm. that, no matter how irrational it gets. Yeah. And I Especially that's dark humor. Yeah. Uh, this play is often called a comedy of bad manners. Oh. Um, <laughs> or a comedy of manners without the manners. Yeah. Uh, because it is, I mean, it sets up kind of stereotypical people and they just behave so badly. And it's in some ways Waiting for Godot is another point of reference for this play mm -hmm. because you laugh and you laugh and then all of a sudden there's a moment where it's silent and you just go, oh my gosh, those people are also in such pain. Yeah. They're so unhappy with their lives. You know, so and what do which, you take something yeah, away from which that? Which makes that moment of pain mm -hmm. all the more poignant because it's just been juxtaposed with you laughing about it. Right. So it makes it's you a, be able to a, accept it a little bit more. It is a brilliant, maybe. brilliant play and I hope folks in uh, Fort Wayne get a chance to see it. It's been, uh, it has been the darling. It played at 35 different professional theaters last year. Well, I was amazed at how popular it is and it's mm -hmm. really not a very old show. I mean, this is extremely modern. Yeah. Just, what was it, 2005? 2005, it was written, I think 2008 is the production uh, because Edie, Th uh, uh, not Edie Falco, the Tony Soprano guy can't think of his name, but um, the, the guy who was Tony Soprano and Jeff Daniels and uh, I mean a stellar, stellar uh, uh, Broadway troupe and then every regional theater in the country it seems like did it last year. The, uh, and they even made it into a, a movie. With, yes. So it's mm -hmm. just the, the subject matter, I guess, it's just going to be very popular for lots yeah, of different, different mediums. There's a truth to it that, that makes people want to see this story. And I, I mean, it's entertaining, you enjoy it, but you also get something out of it, which is First Presbyterian Theater, that's why we exist. There's really no reason for us to do a show if it doesn't speak to the human right. spirit and the human condition. Well, exactly. Well, you know, one thing I w wanted to ask you about was that normally you're the director of these shows at First Pres, and now you're acting in it. <coughs> you know, how do you feel about, you know, being on the stage versus directing? Well, I, I, I came to the theater as an actor. That's where I started. That's where I made my living for 15 years or so before I moved back to Fort Wayne. Um, what I found after uh, directing for several years is that I like doing both because mm -hmm. people often, well, which, if you had to pick one or the, over the other, I, I don't think I could. Yeah. There, there are things that, are, that, are, that I love about both of them. Right. Um, one of the things about acting at, at my home space is that I, I still am producing. And so honestly, when we, we, pl we place ourselves in a blackout, but there's enough light that I can kind of glance out and see how many people are out there. And the producer in me goes, okay, about 80, that's like, a, you know, 15 bucks a ticket. You know, yeah. and I do a quick, <laughs> then, the, then the lights come up and it's like, oh, forget about that, it's time to act. So, <laughs> which when I'm acting at other theaters, I don't do that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great nice to, wear to all leave those, it behind. But wear those different hats. So at times it does, uh, I, I do have trouble leaving the director or producer behind yeah. when I act. Well, I want you to put the producer and artistic director back on and tell us about the upcoming shows at mm -hmm. First Pres. You know, what's coming up this season? Yeah. What's well, coming up for the holidays? And actually, the next one up, because I just said we always do stuff that speaks to the human condition. <laughs> okay, the next one doesn't. Once a year, <laughs> we do something that's usually frivolous and ridiculous and just fun, and that's what Servant of Two Masters is. It's uh, actually a, a 1770 play uh, based on Commedia dell'arte, wild comedy. The Marx Brothers um, are probably the closest in terms of uh, contemporary. Uh, a lot of sketch comedy. I mean, it's just ridiculous fun. And it's, when is that opening? We That one runs October, I think, the 13th through the 27th. Okay. Um, uh, but because actually three weeks from Sunday, we have our technical rehearsal, so it's coming boom, boom. The season will move yeah. along. As soon as we're done here, I'm gonna actually run over and rehearse <laughs> that show. And the, um, then for the holidays, you've got coming up. Uh, it's a Wonderful <laughs> Life. Yeah, we're going Cannot back to go that one. We haven't that. done that for several years, yeah. and that's a, it's a favorite. And it, and it's a feel-good show. It makes people feel good about their lives, mm -hmm. but it also teaches you that, that that central tenant that I think is the central of tenet of Christianity, 
that you need to put other people before yourself. Right. I mean, that's that's what Christ did. That's the whole. That's the Christ-like sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And George Bailey is an archetypal uh, archetypal figure mm -hmm. in that he sacrifices himself first for his brother, then his family, and then his family being his dad and his mom, and then the, the kids that he has. And sometimes, um, I think in contemporary society, and this kind of goes back to God of Carnage, this idea that we worship anything that will get us what we want, yeah. and we are willing to completely destroy everything. George Bailey does not worship a God of carnage. He right. worships a God of mercy and he worships a God of caring. And so it's a perfect Christmas it, show. It surely is. You know, I would want to make sure that people know when God of Carnage is running, because it's mm -hmm. still running for a little while. If you want to tell us how long it's running and We've got how two to more get tickets. weekends. Uh, this weekend, uh, which would be the 14th, 15th, and 16th, we, we have 7.30 evening curtains. We moved to 7.30 and our audiences seem to like that. Uh, so Friday, Saturday at 7.30 this weekend. Our only Sunday matinee is the 16th at 2. Okay. Then our final weekend, we've got a Friday performance at 10.30 because it's the trolley tour. Ah. And our art gallery at First Presbyterian Church is also our theater lobby. Okay. So the gallery the, the trolley tour will end at 10 and we will do a special late night 1030 show which should be a lot of fun and then we close it at 730 on Saturday okay. the, the um, 22nd. And then a phone number for tickets? 422-6329 or the easiest way is go on the web firstpresbyteriantheater.com. Terrific. Thank you for being here Tom. Oh it's always great. God of Carnage sounds like a fabulous show. While we prepare, prepare for our next guest please take a minute to view our performance calendar and we'll be right back with Lauren Nichols from All for One Production to discuss their play, A Peculiar People. Joining me now is Lauren Nichols of All for One Productions. Their play, A Peculiar People, opens Friday, September 21st at the Allen County Public Library. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks Thank for you. being it's here. It's nice to be here. Well, I am wondering if we can start out. Let's talk about the storyline of Peculiar People. I'm thinking that this is a show that it's doesn't... It's a totally unfamiliar yeah. show, so it, you should... Uh, I should definitely explain it. It's set in AD 85, uh, probably the earliest show <laughs> setting we've ever done. It takes place in a single setting inside a Roman garrison prison in a little outpost of the Roman Empire. And inside the cell is a woman named Mariam. She is a young woman who is a Christian, and she's been arrested because she's a Christian. And they're trying to get names of others from her and, and try to round up all of the, uh, the ringleaders and find out where the house churches are in the city of Ostia. She won't cooperate, so she's being sent to the arena. Into her cell is thrown a young man named Justin, who mistakenly is believed to be a rabble rouser philosopher who has been debating uh, Roman philosophers. He's a Christian and has been creating a lot of trouble. The Romans considered Christians at that time to be a threat to just the structure of society. They were considered to be atheists because they didn't worship um, the idols. Same God as everyone. And part of the, the system of idol worship included a whole pantheon of gods and the emperor. So if you were someone who said, no, the emperor is not a god and none of these gods are real, then you were just messing with the fabric of society. And anyone who created that kind of stir was considered a problem. So this young man named Justin is, is thought to be uh, Justinian the philosopher, and in fact, he's not. He's a <laughs> runaway slave. Once he figures out what's going on, he realizes he is really on the horns of a dilemma, because if he tells them who he really is, a runaway slave, the penalty for that is crucifixion. If 
he can't convince them that he's not a Christian, the penalty for that is death in the arena. Oh boy. So <laughs> what do you do? do? Um, there, there's a centurion in charge of the prison who's a very ambiguous figure. Uh, he seems very menacing and yet there's something going on under the surface that is revealed only slowly. And then there's a Roman uh, prefect who is quite the villain of the piece. Uh, it's just a very intimate show. It's. Uh, it's very exciting to be putting this on. You know, well, and where did you find this show? Because my understanding is that this has really only been produced one, one time, time before. Yes, uh, this was produced by the Actors Co-op in Hollywood, at Hollywood Presbyterian in 1990. The Actors Co-op is the country's only equity Christian theater company and they were very new. It was probably their third season when they were given this play by Rick Nehera, who is a very well-known TV writer, film writer, uh, Broadway uh, playwright, actor, teacher, especially among the Latino community. And he's done a lot of writing for In Living Color. Mm -hmm. He wrote a play called Latino Logs for Broadway. A, a big name, but this was a very different venture for him. And they put it on. The secular critics kind of scratched their heads and said, this is doesn't really have anything to do with what we know of Rick Nehera. Um, the Actors Co-op, was not part of their mission to nurture playwrights or help them to know what to do next. So he was left kind of holding the script that he didn't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. He put it in a drawer. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that a dear friend of All for Ones, Michael Wilhelm, who's been working with us for the last eight years, he was living in LA at the time. He had seen the play. Mm -hmm. And about three years ago, when he and his wife moved, he was cleaning out drawers and found the program. Ah. He said, you know, this is an ideal script for All for One. He went looking for it, realized it wasn't published, found Rick's website, called him personally, and Rick sent us this, the manuscript. Um, That's he a great read it, story. I read it, my husband read it. We said, this is almost too good to be true. And, uh, well, and then and you have since spoken I've, with Rick I've Nehera spent a couple of hours well, on the so. phone with him. He's a very gracious man and was thrilled that someone else was actually interested in it. Uh, and uh, he's given me uh, permission to do some light editing to it. And uh, he's anxious to see what we do with it. Uh, is he, he going to come? Get, oh, he can't get here. His <laughs> schedule is so hectic. But we are videotaping it for him to see. So oh, I bet that he's going to love that. having that. Yeah. Now, how long have you been working on preparing this? I mean, if you had to dig It's hard to say. Out, you know, this, this summer, I started to really mm -hmm. work on um, the pre-script work and had my set designer working on it. We had our auditions at the beginning of August. Uh, mm -hmm. This has been a very tight turnaround time in terms of rehearsal. Yeah. Uh, we only rehearse three nights a week as a rule, oh, wow. and this is our fourth week of rehearsal. Our, we go into tech next Monday. And who is in the show? How Eric big is Black the cast? Uh, is playing Justinian. Bridget Bogdan is Mariam. Jeff Salisbury is playing Centurion, and my husband Dennis is playing the villain. Phileas, um, that they're all people I've worked with often and are some of my favorite people to work with, as a matter yeah. of fact. Yeah, well, that sounds terrific. We've got a little graphic there that's it's wonderful to see the, 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 the cast. Um, so this is not the first time that you've had a first-time playwright, you know, no, with all for one production. It's, it's either. one of the great joys for me to nurture young playwrights mm -hmm. or uh, to help along a new play. Michael Wilhelm, whom I mentioned before, his uh, original play, Turtle Soup, was uh, world premiered mm -hmm. with All for One a couple of years ago. Ruth Baker, who mm -hmm. recently won the Civics Playwriting Competition, mm -hmm. we premiered a play of hers at Christmas time several years ago. Why are you drawn to these first playwrights? They need to find a voice somewhere. Mm -hmm. I've been fortunate over the years as a playwright to have a company built in. I, I knew that when I wrote a play, I would have a place to prepare to produce it, right. but so many playwrights are sitting in their living room and they have a, a picture in their head, but often it's very, very difficult for them to get um, a hearing. Right. And so when I come across someone uh, who has a script that I think is really valuable, it's a huge, huge step forward for a playwright to see it on its feet for the first time. And because I am passionate about acting and directing and design work and playwriting, I feel like I can shepherd a new piece and give them encouragement and put them in a better place so that they can move on and perhaps get it published. I That's Rick's goal. Is, is Actually, he's asked me to submit it for him a couple of I was going to say, it so. seems like these new playwrights should be looking you up to, <laughs> I, to help I them. would love to, yeah, to yeah. think that we would become um, a go-to company for people who are looking for a first production. Well, you do four shows a year. Four shows. You know, so uh, tell me some more about what 
what the rest of the shows are for this season. Um, our next show, which goes into rehearsal the day after Peculiar People closes, is An O. Henry Christmas. Uh -huh. We haven't done a, a specifically Christmas play in several years, and this is a lovely piece that showcases several of O. Henry's stories, but in a kind of an unusual context. Um, the premise is a group of homeless people in New York City in 1893 and a rather mysterious southern gentleman who joins them and asks to share in the little bit of food they have in return for telling them stories to while away the hours on Christmas Eve. And that stranger happens to be O. Henry. Ah. So he enlists these, these vagabonds in bringing to life some of his most beloved stories. Now, is that in late November or early that December? That will be um, actually the first two weekends in November. Okay, terrific. And then our company takes a little break over Christmas, and we come back strong in February with a beloved children's classic, A Little Princess, mm -hmm. which happens to be one of my favorite children's stories of all time, terrific. which is why I wrote the adaptation oh. of it. I couldn't <laughs> find one that satisfied and me. And what is the storyline of that? Oh, a, a, a little girl who is uh, in a London boarding school. Her father is living in India where it wasn't considered healthy for children to live past a certain age. It's an um, Edouar Edwardian piece, turn of the, of the last century. And then he suddenly dies, and she's left penniless with a rather uh, cruel and um, miserly uh, headmistress of the school who sends her from being the star pupil in the parlor border up to the attic and becomes a scullery maid. And yet through it all, she has such a, a beautiful, sweet, persevering spirit and a sense of kindness and wanting to be the same person. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a beautiful character study in um, integrity and not changing just because your circumstances change. And when does that? Um, that will be um, the last weekend in February and the first weekend in March. Okay, and and leading into your last show. Yes, we close the season with uh, The Beams Are Creaking, which is a tremendous drama based on the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer a uh, very well-known uh, Christian pastor and writer in Nazi Germany. He was one of the founders of the dissenting church, the, the confessing church, which purposefully broke from Hitler and would not become part of Hitler's state church. And uh, he ended up being tangentially part of a plot to assassinate Hitler, was put into a concentration camp, and eventually was killed just before the end of the war. But he wrote tremendous things in prison, and although it's a darker play, it's a very uplifting mm -hmm. piece, ultimately a very hopeful piece. Well, you know, that kind of takes me back to a peculiar people, even though it's a very serious drama. It's, it's got also a lot an of humor in it. comedy. Yes, yes. in fact, people yeah. have been saying, is this a comedy, is this a drama? Said, eh. It's both. It's the most evenly balanced piece I think I've ever directed. Wow. Um, tremendous tension and excitement mm -hmm. and suspense. It's a very suspenseful piece. You, you may think you know where it's going, but I guarantee you the, the audience will wonder at least twice, I'm not sure how this is going to end. Yeah. Well, and so what do you think they're going to take away? Um, it's a beautiful, subtle exploration of what slavery and freedom are in the world at large versus in the world of faith. Mm -hmm. and what are we all slaves to and what does freedom actually look like? Mm, and it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece and it's a tremendous piece of entertainment. I, you will laugh out loud. And you are performing at the Allen County Public yes, Library. Yes, that's our home stage. And so that's a, a nice, intimate it is. Um, it little is. arena. It, it's a beautiful space for us. Um, it's just enough room and the sight lines are great, the acoustics are perfect. We have a lovely lobby. We always serve complimentary and appropriate refreshments. Um, I suspect it'll be stale bread and brackish water. <laughs> <laughs> that would be appropriate, wouldn't it? Well, let's talk about the tickets, uh, how people can get tickets. Well, they and can when call 622-4610. Uh, Our ticket line is open, and they can go online to allforonefw.org okay. and order tickets that way, or they can just get them at the door. However, our early bird ticket price is only good through next Thursday. Okay. Um, early bird tickets are I think the highest ticket price is $12, and the highest at-the-door price is 15 okay, so We're still to... a wonderful value for money. Oh, I just think that is going to be a terrific show. Um, 
thank you for being You're here. Welcome. Um, you. And thank you for watching Arts Weekly. Next time, we'll talk theater and music. Craig Humphrey from the IPFW Department of Theater will tell us how he has updated The Miser, Moliere's comic masterpiece for a modern audience. Then J.L. Nave, President and CEO of the Fort Wayne Philharmonic, will drop by to discuss the Phil's exciting new season. I'm Melinda Haynes from the IPFW College of Visual and Performing Arts. To stay in tune with the Fort Wayne area's exciting and diverse music, theater, and art scene, join us live next Thursday evening at 7.30 on PBS 39.